and uh, some related uh, categories here. Okay, that's uh, following mainly uh, my joint paper with uh, Georg Regensburger in uh, 2008. Uh, in the second part of my talk, I will come uh, to the main topic of, uh, of this uh, uh, part here, which is uh, integral differential polynomials. So that's uh, the counterpart uh, with Holter Pexter operators of uh, differential polynomials. Okay? Although they are a lot more uh, complicated than differential polynomials in, in their structure. So that's uh, uh, following a paper that we had in ISAC 2008. Um, then I'm turning uh, to a kind of slightly different perspective on integral differential polynomials, namely to see them more or less as the free objects in uh, the suitable category of integral differential algebras. And that's uh, based on uh, joint work with uh, uh, Liguo and, uh, and also uh, Georg Regensburger, rather recent, and uh, that's, that's also still uh, ongoing. And finally, I want to report on some uh, very new work uh, together with uh, uh, François Lunaire and François Boulier and Georg again uh, on um, some first ideas of what you can do if you don't have differential polynomials but fractions. Uh, so you move to the quotient field here and uh, you just think about what happens to integration here. And uh, that's, that's also very recent and uh, fresh. And actually, François Lunaire will give a talk uh, in Acker. Uh, in, in a couple of days from today, where he uh, presents the, the newest uh, insights about uh, this approach here. Okay. We'll come back to that uh, later. Okay, so let me start with the first part, uh, the category of integral differential algebras. And I just start with uh, the simpler version uh, of what is called the rother baxter algebra. Okay. So the rother baxter algebra is uh, the counterpart of a differential algebra, but it has only a notion of integration, no notion of differentiation. And uh, uh, the analog of uh, the Leibniz axiom is uh, this axiom here, which is called the rother baxter axiom. And uh, it is just integration by parts written in a clever way that avoids mention of the derivation. Okay? So if you write down the usual integration by parts formula and then substitute uh, an antiderivative uh, for the function appearing in, in, the, uh, different, in, in the derivation, then you get essentially this uh, axiom here. Uh, except that uh, if you do the integration, the standard integration one, you will not get the last term. The last term is called the weight term. Uh, when lambda is equal to 1, Essentially, that's the only interesting case. Either it's 1 or it's 0. So when lambda is equal to 1, then typically it uh, describes a summation operator. Yeah? So the case lambda equals 0 is the continuous case of actual integration of C infinity functions, for instance. And the case lambda equals 1 is a partial summation. Yeah? So you accumulate uh, partial sums. Either you start with the first term or with uh, the zeroth term. That gives you weight lambda equals 1 or minus 1. And that, again, corresponds to having a forward difference operator or a backward difference operator in the corresponding difference algebra. OK, so that's uh, the main concept of the rother baxter algebra that was introduced uh, by Glenn Baxter. And I have to be careful here a bit, because uh, nowadays there's much talk about uh, Baxter equations, etc. But these are named after Rodney Baxter. If you hear young, young Baxter equation, yeah, that's, that's Rodney Baxter, the physicist. Whereas this one here is Glenn Baxter mathematician, and uh, confusingly, there are now new ideas that connect the two. So then it's, <laughs> it's really dangerous to know which is which. Yeah? But that's uh, the, the Glenn Baxter from probability theory. It's Spitzer's identity, etc. That's, that's where this comes from. OK, so that's the rother baxter algebra. And uh, what I said with the uh, weight essentially being either 0 or 1, this means that any the back stage of arbitrary weight can be brought to the, one of the two cases, either zero or one, but just a simple uh, transformation uh, of, of variables. Uh, here, I'm making things a lot simpler. So here, k could be a commutative ring with a unit. I will usually use a field here. Uh, I'm also assuming in 99% uh, of my talks that the, the uh, algebra is a commutative algebra. Okay? And... Uh, Furthermore, I'm only interested in the continuous case so far. I haven't done any work on the discrete case, out of time restrictions, although it would be interesting. So weight is zero here. And then this axiom really boils down to just that here. 
Uh, if you have seen uh, talks by, uh, by Lee Guo, the, he always likes to write P here for the Robert Beck's opera. I have no idea why P here. Yeah? Maybe because uh, uh, some projectors are also Robert Beck's operators, like in uh, renormalization theory, when you have the field of formal Laurent theories and you, you just take the principal part, yeah, that would be a projector, which is a Robert Beck's operator. But, but anyway, yeah, so I'm really thinking here of the standard integral operator, so that's why I write it like this. It's maybe a bit confusing here because I use operator notation. You would maybe use integral parenthesis, f parenthesis close, but, but I'm putting the parenthesis like this because I'm using it in the style of analysis. But you have to be careful to, uh, that when you write, for example, integral g integral f, it is the integral of g integral f. I, I am, yeah? yeah. So the parenthesis is not put there. Right, yeah, I am. Yeah? So I'm uh, using here a convention on parenthesis which says that every integral here extends all the way to the right, unless some parentheses uh, specify something different. Yeah? So there are hidden parentheses here. It's integral, open parentheses, f integral g, close parentheses. That's just because uh, if you use uh, iterated integrals, it becomes very boring to write all these parentheses. So that's, that's the convention here. Okay? So that's the text axiom in that case. And of course, the primary example is uh, smooth functions. And uh, you use the integral from some initialization point, uh, like zero, to an open upper bound uh, x. So what you get is again a function. Yeah? So it's an indefinite integral, it's very important. Otherwise it's a completely different algebraic structure. Okay, so now uh, I of course want to combine this uh, with the differential structure because for boundary problems we have a differential equation and boundary conditions, Green's operators which are integrals. So I'm assuming now uh, a richer structure that uh, contains a differential algebra over k, and I add this orthodox operator here, yeah? Yeah. which goes from f to f, is again k linear, it's a section, so it's a right inverse, so decomposed with uh, the integral operator is the identity operator, but not vice versa. Yeah? So it's only the integral is only right, right sided inverse, and instead of uh, the rotor Baxter axiom before, instead of this one, which is, so to say, puristic. Yeah? It doesn't mention any derivation. That's the beauty of it. Yeah? But here, on purpose, I'm uh, introducing a hybrid version of the rotor baxter axiom, which does involve the derivation. Yeah? And it's an interesting question how these are related. Okay? So that's what I call the differential rotor baxter axiom. And of course, as you will expect, it's just another way of writing uh, integration by parts, essentially. Okay? And, uh, when you do uh, the maths here, you will immediately see that uh, a consequence is that this here is a projector. Yeah? So whenever you have a right inverse and a left inverse, two operators which are left and right inverse to each other, if you swap them, you get a projector, of course. Okay? So this int composed with d is a projector, and 1 minus it is another projector. That's yeah? the complementary projector. But it turns out that this axiom makes this projector, in addition, a multiplicative projector. So that's an a multiplicative projector. So E of a product of F and G will be the product of, of E of F and, the product, and, and E of G. Uh, another consequence is that, uh, of course, like in, uh, in uh, differential algebra also, uh, the ring of constants is an important uh, sub-ring uh, here. If you have a field, it will be a subfield, of course, but here I'm only assuming a differential algebra. So that's a sub-algebra here. But I can also write it as the image of the evaluation. It's very natural because uh, the evaluation uh, gives me values huh, in the ground field. Huh? So that's, uh, uh, or it can be bigger than the ground field, but uh, I will soon restrict it to the case where this is the ground field. So that's the kernel of D. It gives constants. Huh? If you take a function and you evaluate it, then what you get is a constant, huh? an object here. But unlike in differential algebra, I have another important subspace, which is the image of the integral operator. Huh? Of course, there is no kernel of it because it's an injective function, but it has a non-trivial image. And this is what I call the space of initialized functions, I. Okay? And uh, it can also be written as the kernel of E, as usual with these projectors. And uh, it is a direct summand of the ring of constants. Yeah, so these are two important subspaces of the algebra. One of them is a ring. You see it's a subring, and this i is actually more than a ring. 
it turns out, uh, I will come to this, yeah, that this is actually an ideal loop, okay? So in the standard example of smooth functions, the derivation is the usual one, integral, just integrating from zero to x, and the evaluation is what you would expect it to be. We evaluate the function at the initialization point zero. The constant functions are exactly the constant functions in the analysis sense, and the initialized functions, that is ideal i, is exactly those functions that satisfy the initial condition at zero. Okay? So that's why I call it the initialized ideal uh, Here are some other uh, examples. So of course, there are various uh, standard function spaces. Smooth functions contain the analytic functions, and uh, they, in turn, contain the smallest uh, differential, uh, integral differential algebra, which is the polynomials. They all have uh, the same uh, derivation, except that in the polynomial case, you can define it in a, in a purely algebraic way, of course. And there are many sub-algebras in between. But of course, it's not as easy as to collect differential algebras in between, because closure under the rotor baxter operator is a rather heavy restriction. Okay? But there are many still in between here. Uh, of course, you can also do the same with holomorphic functions, if you have a simply connected domain, so that you don't have any uh, bad effects with uh, uh, disconnected domains. Then also holonomic functions are an important uh, class because they can be handled with symbolic computation. Okay? So that's the idea. You, you specify a function just in terms of uh, its differential equations, its annihilating operators, and a couple of initial conditions. And it turns out that this is indeed closed under all the operations. Yeah? So multi, uh, products of holonomic functions are again holonomic. Antiderivatives are again holonomic derivations, etc. Yeah? So that's another integral differential algebra. Uh, one of the algebras in between the polynomials and the smooth functions is the exponential polynomials. So that's everything that you can write uh, as a linear combination of an exponential monomial, so something like x to the k times e to the lambda x. Yeah? It has this nice closure property. You can even write it down explicitly. With Laurent polynomials, you see already the first problem. Yeah? With the exponentials, I was lucky. Yeah? I was just adding e to the x e to the lambda x or to the polynomials, and it happened to be closed on the integration. Here, if you want to add 1 over x, it's not enough. Yeah? You have to add the logarithm. But again, you're lucky, because here it terminates. Yeah? You don't need more than that. Yeah? But in, in general, it's, it's difficult uh, how far you have to go. But here again, you get a nice uh, closed formula for the derivation and, uh, I mean, for the antiderivative for the uh, rotor text operator. Uh, my only example of a non a naturally non-commutative uh, integral differential algebra is to take matrices. Okay? Component-wise uh, derivation, component-wise integration, that's again uh, an integral differential algebra, a non-commutative one. Okay. Um, all these here are examples of uh, ordinary integral differential algebras in the sense that uh, I call an integral differential algebra ordinary if the kernel of the derivation is just the ground field K. Uh, sorry, the, yeah, the kernel of the derivation, that's the C. Yeah, that's the ring of constants. Yeah? If its dimension over K is 1, yeah, then I call this an ordinary integral differential algebra. But that's slightly different from Ritt's terminology, because yeah, Ritt would only count the number of derivations which you use on a, on a differential ring. But here, it's, it's more useful to make this uh, kind of distinction here. And uh, so you have examples when the dimension of C is 2? Uh, no, with the no, I only have examples where it's infinity or it's one. Yeah, but it would be nice yeah, to study really what exactly is possible. Yeah? So from from the analysis point of view, it's not natural to have dimension two, three, or but it would be interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting. Maybe uh, uh, no, I I, I show you afterwards something that uh, is a bit in this direction. It has dimension one, but it suggests maybe. Uh, how these uh, could look like. Okay? So if you have an ordinary integral differential algebra, uh, then uh, some nice properties will automatically follow. For instance, the integral will automatically also be c-linear, because c is the same as k. Okay? But in general, that's not the case. Yeah? c is the constants in the sense of the derivation. Yeah? And uh, whether you can pull these out of the integral or not, that's, uh, that's, that's the question. But here, of course, it is true. Okay? Another consequence is that E is a multiplicative projector whose image is the ground field K. So in other words, it's a multiplicative functional. Okay? 
And that's what is sometimes called a character. Yeah? The characters of an algebra are just the, the k homomorphisms to the ground field. Okay, so it's, it's one of these, and the i is consequently an augmentation ideal, which means simply that it's a direct summand of uh, of the ground algebra. So i plus k is a direct decomposition of uh, of the algebra. Um, another consequence is that you get the polynomials for free. Uh, whenever you have an ordinary integral differential algebra, then the polynomials are a sub-algebra, and not only sub-algebra, they are a sub-integral differential algebra. Okay? Why? Because the x is by definition just the integral of 1. Uh, you have a unital algebra, so it has a unit element. You take the integral of this unit element, it plays exactly the role of x, so you get an isomorphic copy of the polynomial ring. And in some sense, the polynomials are the smallest uh, integral differential algebra, like, like the prime field within a field. So here are some examples of partial uh, integral differential algebra. So if you take this uh, partial uh, differential operator here, simple uh, with constant coefficients, then you can work out uh, that uh, the corresponding holter Baxter algebra, meaning a right inverse of this operator, is this here. Huh? If you want to find this, what you have to do is you have to solve it PDE. Huh? You have to write down, uh, given f, find, no, sorry, given u, find f such that df dx plus df dy is equal to u. Huh? And the answer will be this operator. Okay? Well, of course, you have some freedom with the integration constant, but, but that's the simplest <coughs> case. And uh, yeah, the, the constants uh, in that case and the quotes yeah, would not be constant functions, but it would be functions that depend only on the difference of x minus y. Yeah? So they are on the diagonal. They are just defined on the diagonal and then uh, moved in parallel. Yeah? So it's a different notion of constants. And the simpler example would be if you take bivariate polynomials, but then you take derivation with respect to x, integral with respect to x, then the constants are clearly polynomials not depending on x. And uh, if you look carefully, it's the same example. Right? It's just a little transformation that goes from one to the other and, and uh, taking a bigger, bigger function ring. OK, and now uh, I come to a funny question uh, having to do with exactly this distinction of uh, whether the integral is, is just k linear or, or even c linear. Because being c linear would be very natural, because c are the constants. So you, you want to pull them out of an integral, right? So the question is, are these constant functions really constant in this sense? Okay? And uh, to answer this, uh, you can look at another weaker concept, and it, this is uh, uh, the surprising result, maybe, that this is really a weaker concept. Namely, you could say, I can also build a kind of uh, structure with the uh, hotel dexter operator and derivation if I just take one differential algebra and one rotor vector algebra, put them together, and I link them only with this section axiom. Okay? One is the inverse of the other, one-sided inverse of the other. That's what uh, Lee uh, called a differential rotor vector algebra. Okay? So the question then is, is this the same thing as, a, as an integral differential algebra? Okay? And that was open for a, for a while. Huh? And it turns out, no, it's not the same. Huh? This is a weaker concept. Huh? Differential water based algebra is weaker. Okay? And uh, as a matter of fact, huh, the differential text axiom, the one that I showed you before, yeah, the strong one, is uh, equivalent to this one here. And that's maybe close uh, to what uh, we learn at school as integration by parts. Huh? And uh, the reason why I'm not using this as an axiom for, for integral differential algebra, even though it's simpler, it's, it's smaller, huh? what, what is the what do you think is the disadvantage of this uh, axiom here? When you say strong, then what do you mean? Differential Baxter axiom? The differential Baxter axiom is... Stronger uh, than the Baxter axiom? Yeah. No. That's, the, that's, so, the so that's, that's, that's the differential Baxter axiom, okay? And that's what characterizes integral differential algebras. But when you say just Baxter axiom, then what is meant is this one here. Okay? And uh, the differential of the Baxter algebra, the uh, axiom, yeah, this one here, turns out to be equivalent to, sorry, to this one here. Okay? So I could also use it as a definition of uh, the category of uh, integral differential algebras. But the problem is that it is asymmetric. Yeah? So in the case of a non-commutative integral differential algebra, like the matrices, I have to use a second one. Yeah? I have to use the symmetric version of it. Whereas the other one, is already symmetric 
and therefore it characterizes fully also the non-commutative case. You get the, as, so more precise statement would be you know, for a non-commutative one, this axiom is equivalent to the two here you know, with the other one here as well. But here I'm using commutative D. Um, it's also equivalent to this formulation of the uh, differential of the axiom, which is yes. Yes, Mule? No. Okay. Please, yeah. Always ask questions. If if anything is unclear, yeah, it's much better get a bit behind uh, with schedule or anything to. But it should be really clear. Okay. So that's uh, what we learn at school. In fact, yeah, because here you have f g minus evaluation of f evaluation of g. That's what you usually write as f g, and then a vertical bar from zero to x. Okay. That's f of x g of x minus f of zero g of zero. Okay? So that's the algebraic way of saying. You do a definite integral, you evaluate the definite integral in this way. Right? But the evaluation here is just defined as 1 minus integration composed with d. So that's also equivalent to it, at least in the non-commutative case when you add uh, uh, the symmetric counterpart. But what is really interesting is that the differential rotor baxter axiom, or I call it here differential Baxter axiom. No, sorry, that's, that's the, the same, same thing. Yeah. Huh? Same, right? yeah. Uh, so this... Uh, Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Huh? So uh, the strong axiom, the differential Baxter axiom, uh, turns out to be equivalent to this structure above together with C linearity of the integral. Okay? And now you see exactly what is missing if you just impose this uh, weaker structure where the coupling between uh, the derivation and the Rotor Baxter operator is, is a bit weaker. Huh? Then what you're missing is this here. Huh? You won't get this uh, automatically. Let me just get this. The yeah. differential Baxter axiom is the axiom for integral differential algebra. Right. Yeah? Yeah. The one that I showed you on the second yeah, slide. Yeah? Right. With four terms. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah? So that's equivalent to the section axiom. Yeah? That integral is a section of the derivation together with the, the usual Rotor Baxter axiom that doesn't involve uh, any integral. But then the coupling has to come here. Yeah? The, so so if, if the ground ring of the differential rotor back to algebra is C itself. Yeah, if it's K, you mean. If, yeah, if it's, it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Then the concepts C, coincide. Then, the then they are the same. Yeah? And in fact, that's one of the reasons why it was difficult to come up with the counterexample. Right. Because all the natural examples, they are cases where these two concepts coincide. Right. So it's hard to find examples where uh, where you have really a differential rotor back algebra which is not integral differential. And uh, I didn't find it myself. Yeah? It, I, I show you afterwards the example. It was Georg Regensburger, who mm -hmm. Georg Regensburger, my, my collaborator, who took up the challenge. And, but that's already several years ago. So another uh, equivalent formulation is that the projector E is multiplicative. Yeah? That's also equivalent uh, to, to the differential Baxter axiom, assuming, of course, the, the usual axioms for a differential algebra and uh, the fact that the integral is a right inverse of the right, derivation. Right. Yeah? Under these assumptions, the differential text axiom and the multiplicativity of the evaluation are equivalent. And what is also equivalent to it is that the i here is not just a subspace, a k subspace of the algebra, but an ideal. Yeah? So that's a funny thing. Yeah? The constants are a subring, but the initialized functions, they are an ideal. So the, um, so the, the equivalences of these things under the top two lines. Right? Yes, yes. It is uh, under the, so the assumption have, that you have, have a full a, differential structure right. and a right inverse of uh, the right. derivation. So, so yeah. if you have a differential order back to algebra, then these things are equivalent. Right, okay. exactly. Yeah. So it tells you exactly what, what in addition do you have to add right. to get the uh, full strength of an integral differential. Okay, so here's a counterexample now that uh, gives you uh, the one that uh, Georg Regensburger found, uh, that gives you something that is only an, a, a differential rotor vector algebra, but not an integral differential algebra. It's a bit uh, unnatural. Huh? So I take uh, any, any ring here uh, and polynomials over this ring. So for instance, take the real numbers. And then, uh, sorry, that's... Uh, By the way, uh, that, that should be a different character here. Huh? Oh. So... Just some, take for instance the complex numbers, yeah, for instance, yeah. And then I take as, a, as the algebra, I think that should be f rather, yeah. We can leave the, the r here, but here should be f, yeah. So then we take the polynomials 
um, in y whose coefficients are polynomials in x, and we mod out the fourth power of y. You can imagine why, no? because if I multiply out the terms in the, in the Rotebeck's axiom, x squared, x squared, x, or y squared, y squared, and this, this will you just appear. Like the foundation of this on the board or something? Yeah. This one? Yeah. I think it's k equals rx, and r equals, and f equals ky. Uh, let me see. So what should be here is, of course, what, what we want is that this here is the f. Yeah? So I can, can also write it as uh, f. F should be, for instance, uh, take the real numbers, polynomials in x, and then polynomials in y, and then we factor out uh, y to the 4. Okay, oh, that's, that's okay. That's the yeah, I think it's written more okay. here. Yeah, but the r the here. K, the k yeah, should be r. There, there should be some different letter here. That, that shouldn't be r, yeah? I mean, it should be double struck r. The f yeah. is k. But the f is k, right? <laughs> Yes, yes, that should be no, F. Okay. Yeah. okay, all right, then that's yeah. No, but that's still not R then. But the simplest is just take this here. Yeah, yeah that's, okay. right, that's right. So okay. that's, that's. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you just, the derivation is the usual one, but uh, the integral is. Uh, uh, one more question. Uh, yes. The, the uh, equivalence is here. Is it only for commutative differential? Yes, okay. that's for commutative, yeah. And what about non-commutative? We haven't studied that, yeah. So we don't know that? No, no, we don't know that, yeah. That's a good question, yeah, but uh, we haven't been pushed uh, to consider the matrix case right, yet. Right, right. Uh, that's one of the next things uh, to talk to. Excuse me. Okay, so then, uh, as another nice example of, uh, of an integral differential algebra, which also works in positive characteristic, I want to show here uh, the Hurwitz series, in particular since, uh, since uh, Professor Kier is also here. Yeah? Um, if we have now an, a field, and now that's the only place where I allow characteristic non-zero, okay? of arbitrary characteristic, but uh, I mean, it only makes sense if it's a positive characteristic. Yeah? So then, of course, as you all know, you, you can't just uh, use derivations and integrations in the naive way, because uh, uh, x to the p uh, is killed by the derivation, and that means that you don't have any antiderivative for x to the p minus 1. Yeah? So you have to have some other ideas of, uh, of how you can do uh, some, something in, in, in the way of integration and differentiation. And the smart idea is to use uh, this uh, uh, approach of Hurwitz series. So it's essentially, you think of power series, and uh, you just collect the coefficients of the power series. So you have a sequence over k, and uh, you define multiplication with this uh, convolution program. Okay? So that really corresponds to the multiplication of power series. Yeah? So that's the smart idea. But the, the point is that you avoid these coefficients that would kill uh, the antiderivative. Yeah? That's the clever idea here. And then the derivation and the integral turn out to be very basic. Yeah? I really love this idea because here, the derivation and the Rotterdam operator, they come down to their essentials because you can think of these sequences as stacks, like in computer science, it's a stack yeah, with the top element A0, and then the derivation is a top operation, pop and push. And then the integral is a push, you push zero on the stack. Yeah? So that, that's how these uh, look like here. Okay? So that's what, uh, uh, what you find in, in this paper, uh, Kia 97. Um, and, uh, uh, more than that, yeah, it's not just an integral differential algebra, it is even what uh, I called uh, in the JSC paper a saturated uh, integral differential algebra. So that's something a bit like uh, a differentially closed uh, uh, field or ring in that case, but much more modest. Yeah? Saturated means that every uh, linear, just linear differential equation of arbitrary order with leading coefficient 1 has a full system of fundamental solutions. Yeah? So if you have an nth order, then uh, you expect a, a, a vector space of dimension n as the solution space. Is this the same for the model theories? Uh, I don't know the model exactly. theories, but, but no, no, sorry. I, I, at that time when I coined uh, this concept, I was not aware that this already existed. Uh, nowadays, you essentially can't invent any term that isn't already used. <laughs> so I was too naive here. Yeah? So in, in that sense, it's saturated. Yeah? 
Like, of course, you know, if you solve differential equations over C infinity, you always get C infinity solutions. If you solve them over analytic functions, you get analytic solutions. And here, it's a bit similar to that case, huh? on the kind of algebraic version, you get uh, uh, all the solutions in, in the um, ring of Hurwitz series. Okay? And of course, if P is zero, then it becomes boring. Yeah? Then, then it's, it's just the usual formal power zero thing. That's not quite the right no? isomorphism. You need to multiply by... Um, I. N factorial. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, sorry, I forgot probably this factor here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. N factorial. Right. Okay. So now I've introduced uh, two categories, essentially, the integrity, or actually already more. Yeah? So of course, there's the category of differential algebras. The morphisms are, as usual, differential morphisms. They compute with the derivations on the left and right side. Now for the rotor baxter algebras, uh, the uh, morphisms are similar. Now you have two rotor baxter operators, integral and integral bar. And the uh, rotor baxter morphism has to respect uh, this structure here. Then there's also uh, the mixture of the two, the category of differential rotor baxter algebras, where the morphisms uh, just have to obey both of these uh, preservation properties. Okay. And again, the, it's a split. Uh, it's a one-sided inverse. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Differential rotor baxter algebra just imposes this section axiom. Mm -hmm. And then the integral differential category would be just the full subcategory. You have the same morphisms, but you have fewer objects. For instance, the one that I showed you before would be lost. Okay, and then a functor would be, for instance, uh, uh, this uh, passage uh, to the matrix uh, ring, and that's the only non-commutative example, so this tilde here means you take the non-commutative... Uh, then, uh, then on the um, second one, where on the right, so you have an S bar or something like that? Where? Here? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, the... Oh, right. it's a different ring. Okay, yeah. okay. That's actually, okay, okay. it's F bar, yeah? Okay, it's just the it's other... F bar, thing. yeah? Has, it, has its own hooker based operator. Okay. okay, so that's a functor that uh, goes from the category of non commutative integral differential algebras to itself. So now, a natural question is what is free object in this category? Okay, what's the free object there? And that turns out to be related very much to the question of what is the analog of uh, differential polynomials here. So you can also ask the question what is the polynomial object? Yeah? Not the free object, but the polynomial object. I will come to this uh, in a minute. Yeah, they are much related. So I start with the notion of uh, integral differential polynomials. Okay? So if we compare this with differential polynomials, uh, one way to, to view differential polynomials is just every term that you can build using these basic operations of plus times derivation also, an indeterminate u, and coefficients yeah, from a given coefficient algebra. And then you can write down terms like that. And of course you can simplify them, yeah? normalize them, and what you get is this uh, usual uh, linear combination of differential monomials with uh, coefficients from, from the f, yeah? from the coefficient uh, ring or field. Yeah? And here is the chain rule, essentially, that uh, gives you for free uh, this very nice kind of normal forms. Okay? So I call this a differential monomial, as usual, and I use this uh, multi-index notation. Okay? So u0 is just u, u1 is the first derivative of u, etc., with uh, the corresponding uh, exponents here. Now, if you want to do the same thing with uh, integrals here, so I have now, in addition to the derivation, an integral operation here available, then the first uh, approach to defining this would be anything that I can write using these operations as before together with an integral. And uh, here's a typical example, what you can write here. But the problem is that uh, there's no chain rule anymore that disentangles this. Huh? There's not, no thing like, a, like an integral differential monomial here, uh, in terms of which we would like to write this as a linear combination. So uh, that doesn't, doesn't work in exactly the same way. And another problem is that we have an additional operation, because if you take the derivative of u prime, where u is our indeterminate, then that should really be u minus u of zero. And that has the consequence that we need another uh, uh, set of indeterminates uh, that uh, um, encapsulate these evaluations here. Okay? So I take this here as a kind of new operation so that I can write this as an evaluation of our indeterminate. Okay? 
And uh, now the problem with normal forms is that the rotor baxter axiom is in some sense, of course, analogous to the Leibniz axiom, but the problem is it works the opposite. Yeah? The Leibniz axiom works in your favor, makes things simpler, but the rotor baxter axiom does the opposite. Yeah? It makes things more complicated. Yeah? Creates nested uh, integrals instead of uh, uh, the given product of uh, plane integrals. And you have to be careful because uh, if you just introduce arbitrary rewrite rules, then uh, this may not terminate. Yeah? And again, as I said before, be careful that my convention is that there are hidden parentheses here, yeah? just to avoid uh, writing lots of them. OK, so, so what kind of monomial? Into the tensor part of notation already. Yeah, a bit, yeah, a bit. Yeah? I will come to it uh, a bit later. But actually, here already I, I will mention this. The first approach that I'm using is not using tensor products. Uh, it's just using uh, the notion of a polynomial domain in uh, universal algebra. You okay? can introduce polynomials in, in any variety. Okay? And uh, the second approach that I will show you, that that will use uh, indeed uh, the tensor product, and uh, it will turn out that the free object is of course given essentially by the shuffle product, but then if you want uh, not just uh, the free object, but uh, the polynomial object, then you have to take the co-product uh, with the coefficient ring. Okay? So I start with the universal algebra approach because that's more like a symbolic computation. It was, was also the one that we did earlier. Uh, the second is more abstract, more elegant, and also more general, but it's maybe easier to start with, uh, with the universal algebra approach, okay? So I'm now writing again u of zero, but you shouldn't think of this as an actual function that is evaluated. It's just a notation for e of u. Oh, sorry, uh, what is the shuffle algebra? I will come to that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I will come to that. Yeah, uh, it's just a nice uh, product structure on. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, so that's uh, just notation for the evaluation. So it's I'm not leaving algebra here. Yeah, it's just a notation that makes it look a bit nicer. And as before, yeah. So that there are lots of parentheses if you want to add them. Yeah, so. Just want to be lazy here. And uh, as, uh, uh, as was remarked, yeah, that really corresponds to a tensor problem. But you have to be careful with these tensors. Yeah? The leftmost tensor factor is very special because it is the one outside of all integrals. Mm -hmm. And the consequence is that the product structure will just multiply the outermost, the leftmost normally, but it will have to shuffle the innermost ones. Yeah? So everything except the outermost one. Okay, so what is a, a variety and what are polynomials in universal algebra? So variety here does not mean um, algebraic set yeah, in the sense of algebraic geometry. Variety here means uh, something like uh, the category of all rings. Yeah, that forms a variety. The category of all Lie algebras. That's a variety. Yeah? I so, I thought a variety has to satisfy the equation only. Yes. Yeah. So it is more precisely. Uh, any structure that you can write as a carrier set and some operations which have to be all operations, yeah? So no relations, yeah? Less equal, for instance, is not allowed, so a pose set would not be a variety, yeah? The, the class of all pose sets is not a variety. You're only allowed operations, functions of any arity, yeah? Like binary, unary, ternary, it's not very frequent, but, uh, but any, any carrier set A and operations a to the n to the a, uh, a to the n to a. Yeah? Uh, these operations, yeah, it all becomes very complicated as you start writing this out in detail. Yeah? And you have to have an arity function that gives you the arity of the operation here as n, and, uh, and that describes exactly the terms that you can allow, etc. So that's, that's what the signature does. Yeah? So you have a, a, a list of uh, symbols, like plus, times, etc., and uh, an association of an arity with each symbol that just tells you how many arguments you use on it. Okay? So the first restriction for a variety is only operation symbols, no relations, and the second restriction is that the relations are only identities, yeah? something of the form for all x1, for all x2, etc., left equals right side. Okay? That's an identity. Yeah? No other axioms. Okay. So, uh, in inter integral domains would not be a variety. Which? Integral domains, because you have this zero divisor uh, prevention yeah, that right. is not, not allowed. As, not even fields. Not even fields are a variety. Huh? Mm -hmm. Because in a field, you say yeah, for right. all x unequal zero, yeah, right. x times x to the minus one is one. Huh? It's not a variety. Huh? But still, mm, I would say 80% of the typical structures we use in algebra are, are varieties. Huh? Okay. 
And the laws, as I said, yeah, they must all have this form left equals right hand side with some free variables. So a typical example is uh, groups. Yeah? Here you have uh, three operation symbols, multiplication, the inverse, and uh, the identity element. The first has arity two, so it takes two arguments. Second is a unary function, and constants are treated as nullary functions. Yeah? They don't need any, any arguments, okay? And uh, uh, lattices, yeah? lattices would have uh, a, a meet and a join operation, both being unary, uh, sorry, both being binary, and uh, you can work out the axioms. Yeah? They, they are all identities of the form prescribed above. Yeah? So that's that's a typical variety. Non-commutative rings, or yeah, non-commutative rings with uh, with unity. Yeah? Um, if I say rings here, then then obviously I'm in non-commutative. Yeah? So here, that's the signature. Yeah? Just uh, same as Abelian groups, but now I write uh, this uh, here as a plus, yeah? and uh, I have this uh, commutativity axiom in addition. So, and, the, so the thing in parentheses are just optional, right? Just yes, like, yes, yeah, I mean, which you can add or not, yeah, because they, they are right. different just varieties, but uh, uh, very similar, okay? And now something that one has to distinguish here is uh, k-algebra. Yeah? If you want to have the variety of k-algebras, then you have to add to this signature the scalar multiplication. Yeah? But a scalar multiplication, if you write it in the usual way, yeah? there would be an operation from k cross a to a. But that's not allowed. Yeah? You're only allowed to go from a to the k to a. So the trick is you just uh, take out this uh, k here and you and parameterize okay. the operation. Yeah? So for each lambda in k, you have uh, one such operation and you can write down the axioms. So that's another variety. And very important for us, differential and integral differential algebras, they are, of course, also varieties. We have unary operation, derivation, and, and uh, the Baxter axiom, and uh, the usual axioms. Okay? So now you know what these varieties are. And uh, it's now possible to define the notion of a polynomial object for any such variety. And that's uh, taking uh, two steps. The first is uh, you build uh, the so-called term algebra. So in addition to the variety itself, which is specified by the signature and the, the identities, we take a set of variables. And now we are allowed to build any term using these uh, variables and our operations. Okay? And that gives us the term algebra. And if I then factor out the given identities in E, uh, so that's uh, the congruence relation generated by, by the identities, then I get the so-called free algebra. And that corresponds exactly to the notion of, uh, of the free axiom, uh, of the free object in, in category theory, uh, with these morphisms. Okay. And now the polynomial algebra is something a little bit uh, uh, more elaborate. In a polynomial algebra, you are given, in addition, a coefficient algebra. So that's just one particular object in this uh, variety, which we use for coefficients. So then what we do is, in addition to the variables, we may also use elements of A okay, for building terms. And on the other hand, we don't factor out just the identities of E, but in addition, we also factor out any uh, ground equation, so to say. That 2 plus 2 is 4, yeah, such things, they're all factored out. Yeah? So everything we know about the domain A is also taken into account. Yeah, and with this notion of polynomial, which is uh, pretty general, many things that uh, we know from, uh, from uh, commutative algebra uh, go through in very much the same way. For instance, uh, one important characterization is the substitution homomorphism, that uh, if you uh, prescribe um, any values for your variables, so the x is the variables here, and you can also lift the coefficients to some different coefficient domain, then there is a unique map that extends these two here uh, to the whole uh, polynomial object, okay? So that's uh, just substitution here in this context, okay? And uh, it turns out that uh, this polynomial object is the co-product of uh, the A itself and the free algebra. So that's exactly the sense in which uh, a polynomial object is a bit more than a free object. So if you look at some examples, yeah, here are, for instance, groups. Yeah, then on the left-hand side, you see a group polynomial. Yeah, this is x and y, right, g and h. Yeah, 
And I think of the coefficients here as, for instance, uh, concrete permutations from S3. Or lattices, yeah? they would look like this. Yeah? If I use here as coefficients uh, the real numbers with minimum and, and maximum, that's a lattice polynomial. Yeah? Uh, in commutative, for instance, algebras, that's not interesting. That's uh, the starting point of it all. Then that's exactly the polynomials as usual. Uh, for non-commutative rings, it's a bit unexpected. Yeah? You don't get non-commutative polynomials because uh, the corresponding polynomial object here is a bit finer because it would not allow coefficients to commute with the indeterminates. Yeah? And a typical example would be if you take quaternions, and I think of this as a polynomial uh, where I want to substitute into the u and, and the v other quaternions. Yeah? So it's a kind of quaternion polynomial. And in that case, I would not want the u here to commute with the coefficient. Okay? So that's a polynomial in the, in the variety of non-commutative so, so there, there are five factors in there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And of course, I could add, I mean, it's just a small example, but as usual, I can take linear combinations. I mean, there's no evaluation in that. No, 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 there's no evaluation. That only comes when we have integral differential algebras. Huh? Uh, but of course, the usual non commutative polynomials can also be constructed. Here, you have to take instead of the non commutative rings, the non commutative K algebras as a variety. And you get these. Okay? Differential polynomials are, of course, uh, obtained if you take uh, the variety of differential rings okay? and a coefficient uh, differential algebra F. And now, here's a definition of integral differential polynomials. I just take the variety of integral differential polynomials and one concrete uh, integral differential algebra F as coefficients, and I get the polynomial object. And I'm abusing uh, the usual notation here because, in some sense, that's a special case. Uh, just forget about the derivation, uh, the integral, uh, but the terms become more complicated. Yeah? So if I'm not interested in any constructive characterization, my work is finished. Yeah? I've defined them, they exist, yeah? and you can read it up in, in the Lausch Neubauer book, yeah? how this works in detail. But of course, it's not worth much because we can't compute with them. Yeah? So it's just a definition, and what we need is canonical forms to really compute with this. And uh, what that means in detail is, uh, you see the uh, polynomials are defined as a, as a quotient algebra over the term algebra. So what we want is a canonical term. For every, uh, every element in, uh, in, in the term algebra, I want to find a unique canonical term that is equivalent to it, and that is its canonical representative. And of course, the map from an arbitrary t to this canonical one should be computable, uh, the canonical simplifier. And the first step to that is to realize that you can always use uh, the rotor baxter axiom uh, to um, boil down any complicated uh, integral differential term into linear combinations of these here. Okay? And of course, you remember these are nested. Uh, these are nested integrals. So they're all these parentheses here. Yeah? So what this tells you is you can avoid products. Yeah? Any product can be using the rotor baxter axiom can be flattened into a linear combination of uh, pure nested integrals, okay? And uh, uh, here, of course, uh, this, these are all uh, products of uh, u times u prime squared, u double prime cubed, etc. You, you can have everywhere in these uh, slots, you can have differential monomial. Okay? So that's the first step, yeah? That's... Uh, uh, um, a sufficient uh, basis, uh, sufficient uh, to, um, to describe any integral differential term here. And of course, if n is zero, then this doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't appear. Yeah? Then you have only the part uh, in the front. Yeah? And that's where the evaluations go. Uh, they are also contained in this front part. OK, so here's an example. Huh? If you take this, two. Uh, so the such evaluation integrals. operator computes with the uh, integral operator? Yes, that computes, yeah, that computes, yeah, unfortunately. And, and yeah. also the differential operators? If we have more, but here I have only one. It's only one differential operator, yeah, it's right. a but very modest setting, but of course... He commutes with both Yes, operators. yes, if I have more, I let them commute, yeah. Right, yeah, so that's how you break it down into this, but the problem is that uh, uh, there are terms here 
that uh, mean the same element. Yeah, there are too many of them. Right. Yeah? <laughs> These are not canonical because, for instance, yeah, whenever you have a coefficient here, you can write it in that way. Yeah? This would be allowed here as a candidate for a canonical form, but it isn't canonical yeah? because, uh, because you can use here another axiom. Yeah? To reach this canonical or this non-canonical form, you just use the plain orthodox axiom, but here you have to use the differential orthodox axiom. It does a different work, and uh, that falls apart here. Yeah? So we want to banish this uh, integral f u prime, and uh, that leads to the notion of functional monomials. So if I have an arbitrary differential monomial, then I distinguish three cases here. Uh, the simplest is, of course, uh, uh -huh, okay. Yeah, I, uh, the simplest case would be if. Um, if uh, all the betas are zero. Yeah? So that's not even mentioned here. Yeah? That's what I call quasi-constant somewhere. But, but here, if, if it's not a constant differential monomial, then uh, the interesting distinction is whether the highest derivative occurs linearly or not. Yeah? If it occurs linearly, then I call it a quasi-linear differential monomial. And otherwise, I call it a functional monomial. Actually, that's uh, a terminology that was introduced by Gelfand uh, in his study of uh, integrable equations uh, maybe 40 years ago. Yeah? So it turns now, now it turns out that uh, if you restrict the exponents of the inner integrals to functional monomials, functional exponents, then you, in, you get indeed a set of canonical forms uh, for these integral differential polynomials. Okay? So this one, of course, can be arbitrary. Yeah? can also be quasi-linear. But the ones uh, inside the integral, they should be functional because otherwise, I could immediately use this uh, uh, integration by parts involving the derivation to, uh, to get it out. Okay? So that's the philosophy of the canonical simplifier. Okay, and now uh, we have only um, a, a algorithmic description of the, the terms themselves, and we can add them, of course, but how do we multiply them? And that's now uh, about this shuffle product here. The derivation is simple. Yeah? It's just using the product rule. We differentiate coefficients. We differentiate these integral terms where, uh, actually, uh, it's uh, before you ask uh, about this, uh, whether it computes. Um, but uh, if, if there's a term that starts with an integral here, and here's some u of, of gamma. Uh, and if I use an integral on this, then, of course, I just get uh, u of n uh, because of the section axiom. Yeah? So together with the section axiom and the product rule, I can differentiate any of these uh, terms. So that's easy. But the difficult thing is, how do we do integration? And uh, what is this here? Yeah. And uh, uh, that's what, what I will do next, except that first here, I just want to mention that uh, we can also say exactly what are the new constants, because uh, this f here will already have its own subring of constants. Now I move to this bigger ring of integral differential polynomials, and it turns out that, of course, all these u of zeros are now constants. Huh? That's because they are evaluations. And uh, it, actually, the, the constants now in the bigger ring are all linear combinations of these uh, powers of such evaluations where the coefficients must be constants in the original ring f. Okay? And now using this, I can define now the integral on, the, on this uh, integral differential monomials, if you want to call them like that. And uh, I have to distinguish uh, three cases. Yeah? So I have this guy here. Yeah? What is the integral of this? And it's a bit uh, dangerous now because we have to distinguish two integrals. Yeah? Actually, even three. Huh? <laughs> so this integral here is just part of the structure. Huh? It's not an operation. It's like when you write the differential polynomial, then you may have u double prime, but it's just an indeterminate, yeah? differential indeterminate. The same here. Huh? That's part of the structure. But this integral here is the one I want to define. That's an actual operation that goes from this ring to itself. Okay? So in the first case, when uh, u to the beta is constant, then it's, of course, easy, because then I can just go across here because these are constants, yeah? but I can, can go across, and uh, uh, I just use uh, essentially uh, the uh, rota baxter axiom in the ground ring f to re rewrite this here in this way. Yeah? And by recursion, uh, I'm now, well, that actually doesn't even need recursion here. No, here I don't need recursion. Yeah? So that's immediately 
um, the, the integral of this here, huh? in that case. So the interesting case is when, uh, um, when this is quasi-linear, okay, because here I have to define it uh, recursively. Huh? I have here uh, b u to the zero. Huh? So this part stays the same anyway. There's only interesting thing what happens here. If this beta is uh, quasi-linear, um, then this means its highest term uh, Oh yeah, yeah. This means that I can write it in this form. Yeah, the highest derivative will appear linearly. Yeah? So it will be just the uk plus one. Yeah, and then the derivative before it has some exponent beta k, and uh, I'm now using integration by parts to just rewrite this as an integral with uh, a smaller number of uh, of, uh, of derivatives here, um, uh, using this uh, monomial here. Okay, and of course. That's, this goes recursively. Yeah? Here I'm applying this definition again. Yeah? So that's the quasi-linear term. And the functional case is the most beautiful one because if this is a, a functional monomial, then I can just write it in front of it. Yeah? Then this operation here now becomes part of the structure because that's allowed. Yeah? That's beta is functional, so it's a canonical form already. Okay, so that's... Uh, how this looks like, and uh, it's really algorithmic, and it's also implemented in the in the Theorema version uh, um, as integral differential polynomials. Okay. What does computable mean? Computable uh, means that the operations, the addition, uh, multiplication, etc., are all al algorithmic. So there's an algorithm that gives you the sum, the derivative, the integral. Yeah. So this is a uh, theorem in computability. Well, it's not an interesting complexity analysis or anything. No, it no, just no, says that computability. Yeah. So it's it's there's a, you could say that there's a Turing function, a Turing machine that uh, that uh, computes the sum, that computes right. yeah. Right. But I mean, intuitively, it's just that you can carry out the operations here, and then it says then then you can also carry out the operations there. It, it preserves uh, computability in that sense. Okay, so that was the universal algebra approach, and now I have to be quick uh, to go through the uh, free uh, uh, object approach. Um, it turns out that uh, the free object is actually a special case, because uh, uh, it's the case when uh, the uh, coefficient ring is just a ground ring with zero derivation. So I have just uh, two minutes left. Huh? So then let me, let me be fast here. Okay. So the usual definition of the free integral differential algebra is exactly what you expect, okay? And uh, the, the free object uh, is the one where the derivation is trivial. Yeah? So if you have coefficients which are just constants, yeah, then you get the free object. And as I said before, you get the differential integral differential polynomials by taking a co-product with, uh, uh, with the um, free object, okay? So here's the shuffle product that was mentioned before. Uh, the free, the free Walter Baxter algebra can be written as a tensor product of uh, A itself and the shuffle algebra, and that corresponds to the effect that I mentioned before. The, the outermost, the leftmost coefficient is very special. You just multiply with a given multiplication in A. But for all the other ones, you do this shuffling business, which is either described recursively or with one big sum uh, going over all m n shuffles. So that's the reason for this. Yeah. This notation here for this terminology, and uh, um, again, uh, what you get is uh, first of all uh, the free integral differential algebra as a simple consequence of the existence of the free uh, differential Rotterdam algebra. That is much easier. Yeah, the free object in the differential Rotterdam category, because there you essentially just take the normal differential polynomials because they are the free object in the differential uh, algebra category and then the shuffle algebra or the Rotterdam algebra on that. Yeah? That gives you the free uh, differential Rotterdam algebra and then you mod out this additional axiom and then you get a non-constructive description of the free object. Okay? And now I cannot go through the uh, construction here of... Uh, of uh, how you do this now uh, in an um, algorithmic way, but the idea is that uh, 
uh, you use uh, the tensor structure here and a distinguished uh, antiderivative, a so-called quasi uh, derivative, uh, uh, quasi antiderivative, which is not not even a right inverse of uh, of the derivation, but only an inner inverse. Yeah? So an inner inverse, or sorry, it's actually an outer inverse in the other direction. Yeah? Outer inverse uh, means that f bar, f f bar is equal to f bar. Okay? So that's uh, a weaker weaker concept of uh, of inverse. Okay, so. Okay, and I'm not uh, dealing with uh, the fractions here for time reasons. 